about six years ago. It's cold, it's raining, it's gloomy in London. I am a young mother expecting my second child, but also a law student. And I have to juggle between being a mother, a student, and a wife. And it's not easy. And I was usually just in and out of my lecture halls. I couldn't be a typical student. I couldn't hang around the cafeteria. I couldn't hang around the university. And I was literally just dragging my suitcase, going to the library, borrow books, rush back home to my baby. That had been my life over a year. None of you here is, is about to go to university anytime soon, so don't miss your orientation, because I miss my orientation clearly, and I didn't know that there are all these great online resources that I could have just taken advantage of and not have to go to the library, dragging legal textbooks back home, and I could have just accessed them over a device in the comfort of my home. So until this one day, the librarian came to me and said, you, don't, you actually don't have to take two of those books that you have there with you because they are online and there are articles in journals that can actually support you as you're learning that, through that book. And there's, there's discussion forums that are supporting those resources. There are other students who want you to learn with them. And I... That was a light bulb moment for me. I had, I had studied in Tanzania with a teacher and a blackboard, and my other alternatives were textbooks from the library, if I ever went to the library, and tuition classes. So that was very new. And from then on, that became my new life. I became an online junkie. I literally just bought everything online. I loved the idea of technology. I loved the convenience of technology. The fact that you can be anywhere, but you have so much power in your hands. And to me, the first thing that really changed how I view technology was access to information, access to knowledge. I finished with an upper second degree, came back home to a promising legal career, and the same year, Tanzania had the worst secondary education form for results. Over 92% of students had failed. To put it in numbers, that was over 700,000 young people. In reflection of what technology had done for me to be able to just juggle my responsibilities and be able to learn, I thought I would go to an organization an education organization and ask them to allow me to volunteer while I'm working as a lawyer so that I can start what I thought would be an online platform for them and I don't have to work full-time I can just do it part-time while I pursue my legal career and again it was very new what I was suggesting had never been done in Tanzania there was no secondary school curriculum there was no primary school curriculum that was digitized and available for students locally. There was only international curriculums, things that you'd find from other countries, think of the Khan Academies, and, and not really anything that was local, relevant, and contextual to the education system in the country and in several countries in Africa. And so 2013, we officially started. And at that time, there was Keen Innovation Hub, which is no longer there, but I went there hoping that I would get inspiration from the tech space and be able to know the right platforms to develop for this educational content that I think should be out there. And there are so many challenges in education. There is lack of textbooks, there is lack of teachers, there is lack of libraries, lack of laboratories, but all those, all those things uh, when you find a good teacher, when you find a good textbook, when you go to a good school, what you're really getting is educational content, it's resources. And I wish I could solve everything, 
And at that time, I had the same purpose. I wish I could solve everything in education. I really believe education is what can really empower a person to their fullest potential. But I knew that one thing that can change that narrative would be just creating access to educational content. And access is great through technology. Technology overcomes so many barriers, geographical barriers, physical barriers, gender barriers. I was a young woman, and technology didn't know I was a young woman. When I log in, all it knows, a user has logged in. So Keen Innovation Hub was a perfect place to be. And I got the inspiration. And of course, I couldn't, I couldn't, really, I couldn't really know so much, because I was coming from a legal background. I'm not a teacher, and I'm not a developer. So met my first partner there. His name is Fayaz, and he joined in. And at the same time, Iku, who is now our general manager, also came in. And we moved to Mara Foundation. Again, it was there at the time, it's no longer here. We moved to Mara Foundation, which was providing a co-working space with several other companies. And for us, it was so important to be able to leverage what was already available in the system that's supporting technology, that's supporting innovation. And we knew that we are learning in the process, and we knew that we also have to start small and start lean. You can also start small in a grand office, which personally I could have afforded, but I thought that this is an idea that I want to see growing and working and just overcoming its own challenges. And we went to Mara Foundation, which then was 150,000 shillings, but enabled us to share a table, three of us. It had coffee, tea, and a printer. And we were there for several months. While at Mara Foundation, that was the time for us to research more on the idea, start building the, the first platform, and start getting to know where can we get our money, and start to understand funding, finance, grants, loans, gifts, all sorts of finance that can support the idea. For us, Mara Foundation was a typical launch pad. It was a place where we wanted to work and we wanted to get more information on how to best start Shure Direct. And it was, a, it was a great time as well to just be able to, to be in a space where you would meet other people who are struggling just as you are, and they want to succeed just as you do. And it's so important to be able to be in that same mind space because you might feel some of the things that you're going through as an entrepreneur are very unique to you. And then you come to realize, actually, that's just the modus operandi of being an entrepreneur and working in our, in our market. And that makes you not feel so lonely. It makes you understand that you're in this together, and these challenges, they're not unique, and they can actually have a solution. So we were there for several months, and we are just under trying to understand the market. A few months in, there was a competition that was announced by um, Tigo Reach for Change, which was looking, it was looking for a digital change maker. And of course, at that time, we had applied to several, and we had got we had received several no's. And I think I was applying to the wrong competitions, wrong funders, because some of them, I thought that the idea was so good. And here's the thing about, about, about idea. I thought it was so good. I thought this is it. Like, this is the thing that you would want to fund it. Like, who doesn't want to fund education? I mean, we, we are in Africa, and we know that education is such a big challenge. We have over. 16 million young people not educated right now. And we know that education is what can really take them to the next level in their lives. You would want to fund that. And that's not the case. And I was going, so I was going to venture capitalists, I was going to impact investors. And I remember, so there was one, a specific fund that I applied to, it was an impact investment fund. And there was so many, so, there was so much feedback about what we're doing wrong, what you have to do right. And we took it, we took it to heart. It hurt, of course, we, we didn't get the money, but we were able to learn through the process. And we got our first grant from Reach for Change, and it was small, okay, it's a big amount, but now I can say it was a small amount, because at that time it was such a big amount. It was $25,000, and we still did not want to, to, to go grant. We, were still, we still wanted to use that money effectively. We still stayed in Mara Foundation to be able to just narrow down 
our expenses, to be able to know what exactly we should focus on. And that was the first, the first fund that really kind of just got us, to, got us off on our feet and be able to assist us in raising more funding. And from that, we were able to keep on raising more funds. We were able to start developing our platforms. We had our first platform. Um, it's a web platform, suredirect.co.tz. We moved on to our next platform, an SMS platform. We moved on to our third and fourth. And now we are moving on to create diversified content that is addressing the different learning gaps in society, not just focusing on curriculum, which we now have the entire secondary school curriculum for Tanzania, but we focused on, we're focusing now on creating diverse content that is not necessarily curriculum based, but supporting young learners to be able to have developed potential, to be able to access the opportunities that are around them. So think of agriculture, financial literacy. We want to become a content powerhouse, not just in Tanzania, in Africa. And it takes a while, we understand that, but we want to get there. And for us, the biggest thing is taking small steps, but towards our big plan. And the other thing which is so important for us was getting the know-how. What we did at first, which is not so obvious in the grand scheme of things, we created an educational content repository. So for the tech guys, you understand this. So our entire content database, our entire, everything that we create sits in this repository and you don't have to, to recreate content. We just create access to, to this content that is already sitting there. And it's, for us, it's not, about, it's not about just coming up with an idea. It's something that we've already planned because it's already in our repository. So we took time to develop this repository which manages everything we create, everything we are going to create. And there is a plan. There is growth, but this growth was pre-planned. And I think as, as an entrepreneur, you could be a social entrepreneur, you could be just an entrepreneur, which is also fine. The biggest thing is preparation. And I think we don't take enough time to prepare and we might not, we don't take enough time to research, to know where exactly we should, we should go next. And it's so important to be able to understand that not every good idea is yours to implement. I kind of learned this the hard way. I was trying so many things. And a few years ago when I was 16, my first boss was doing so many things. He was a med, yeah, a few years ago, like three years ago. <laughs> My first boss was, was doing several things at the same time. He was a medical doctor, he was an insurance broker, he was a businessman, he was into media. And, and he told me that you, you, can, you can be anything. But what I didn't learn then was that you cannot be everything at the same time. You have to be able to pace yourself. Be something at one time, dedicate yourself towards that. Deliver what you have to deliver in that space and move on to the next. Dedication hard work, and of course, embrace failure. I love the idea of failing because from my failures, I have learned so much. And before I win, I love to fail. It's, it's what makes success so beautiful. Thank you so much.